Hello everyone, I'm Travis Atkinson and I serve as the Board Public Affairs and Member Benefits Coordinator for the International Society of Schema Therapy, or ISST. Today I'll be talking with Wendy Bahari, who's the former president of ISST, who served from 2010 to 2014, and will be a keynote speaker at the Inspire 2016 conference in Vienna, which begins on June 30th and runs through July 2nd this year. Wendy, welcome. Thanks, Travis. Great to be with you. Great. Well, I'd like to share a little background information so that all our viewers are familiar with you and the work that you've done. Of course, you've been uh, working as a therapist for more than 25 years, postgraduate training, and have advanced level certifications. Wendy's the founder and director of the Cognitive Therapy Center of New Jersey and the New Jersey Institute for Schema Therapy. Wendy's been treating clients, training professionals, and supervising psychotherapists for more than 20 years. It's hard to believe. Uh, only I'm because, old. of course, how could you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wendy trained. I, start, in, I started at 12. <laughs> started at 12, basically. <laughs> Wendy trained and worked with the founder of Schema Therapy, Jeffrey Young, since 1989. And Wendy is currently the chair of the Brainstorming Subcommittee for ISST. She's the co-author of several chapters and articles on schema therapy and cognitive therapy and is the author of Disarming the Narcissist, now in its second edition, and specializes in treating narcissists and the people who interact with them. So the title of her keynote is Empathically Attuned Caregiver Mode in the Treatment Room. She uses the quote from Bogart and Greenberg stating, Empathy is not just a therapeutic skill, it's a basic relationship process. So, just to set that up, so our viewers know what you'll be talking about, Wendy, you've discussed seeing the empathic stance as the most critical part of the schema therapist posture in working with clients or patients. That's right. Can you help us understand why that is? Yeah, sure. I, I think those people who are familiar with me when I speak about empathy know that I feel it's probably the golden nugget, that's what I like to call it, of our therapeutic posture. And I say that because, you know, embedded in the, the meaning of the term empathy is the notion of understanding. Understanding at every level, uh, intellectual understanding, emotional understanding, um, a kind of even sensorial or physiologic understanding. We feel it in our bones. We feel it in our skin. And I think that different from sympathy and compassion, empathy is about making sense out of one's story feeling their story, sensing their story, this idea of attuned resonance with the patient in the room with you is, and, and now there's data to support this, it's critically important to the patient feeling gotten, feeling felt, feeling known. And I think we all know the value of being in the presence of someone who knows us. Sometimes it leaves us a little shaky and uncomfortable, but mostly it makes us feel some somewhat comforted because Knowing us means making sense out of what we're thinking and feeling. Um, it, it allows us to be able to help our, our patients to make sense out of sometimes their greatest forms of suffering. Hmm. So that comes from having a sense of safety that the therapist in the room with the client or the patient really is trying to understand where they're coming from and can feel what they're going through. They feel it through us, you know, they can yeah. sense it through our reflection. So empathy becomes almost like a reflected response, but not just in parroting what they're saying, right. but in, in being able to be re real, really real, really present. You know, expressions like, oh, I, I can imagine, or oh, I, I can't hardly imagine, I'm trying to imagine, and I sense that, and oh, how hard that must be. and, and that must have been so scary for you because we're sensing it, not because it's the right thing to say or we're just being kind, but it's mm -hmm. really resonating within us. Mm -hmm. Right. It makes me think of the difference between when you say parroting, like mirroring back what yeah. a person is saying versus a reflection, which, I mean, really can be a revelation to a person yes. when they really understand. That makes yes. so much sense. Yeah. And yeah. How is empathy the golden nugget, as you refer to it, for effective healing of schemas and modes? Because I, I think that when we get why, uh, I'll say if I, if I were the patient, once I am helped to truly understand how I'm put together, 
Mm -hmm. why what I'm feeling is causing me suffering, why what I'm believing about myself. What we would say is, is founded in our schemas, right, our early maladaptive schemas. How they hold us hostage has a lot to do with what we've learned, what we've experienced, and how we're put together, you know, from a temperamental point of view. But when I understand all of that, not just in a mentalizing way, but in a, in a real felt way inside, mm -hmm. that opens the gateway for things like grieving, and letting go and ex and realizing the losses in my life, having someone help me hold the pain um, along with me because they get it. Mm -hmm. You know, they get it in the best way they can get it because I've narrated my story from my emotional place. And and so as the therapist, if I can be receptive to that and I allow that to resonate within me, my patient can sense their story reflected in me. That's the beginning of a healing process. It's mm -hmm. the navigational tool for knowing where do we go next, mm -hmm. you know, to to make the difference. So being able to really work with that vulnerable child inside that patient and exactly. it, it also made me think of with a mistrust abuse schema, what you were saying a moment ago about, you know, attunement, if the therapist is really feeling what the client or patient is experiencing. But imagine for some people that could be really vulnerable because yeah, they're going absolutely. to expect that the caregiver yeah. is somehow going to use it against them or punish them. Yes, yes. And, and, and another, you know, when we think, of, I'll, I can relate this to something that you're quite familiar with, which is your expertise in couples. And you and I have talked about this. When you think about the toxic poisons founded in resentments yeah. and, and broken trust, yeah. when a therapist can help the we'll call it the offender in the relationship, to realize and truly understand what may have driven them to commit an act of infidelity or, mm -hmm. or some breach in the relationship. Really get it. And in addition to that, really begin to empathically understand the impact on their partner. That's the beginning of healing trust. Yeah. But without that deep layer of understanding of both the motivational aspects as well as the impact of the offense, it's very difficult to get off square one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do I know that my partner and my spouse isn't going to hurt me again if exactly. I don't have a sense that he or she really gets or understands the pain yes. that I've been through? Yes, exactly. yes, and why it affects me the way it does. Right, right. Instead of demonizing me or just thinking that I'm being a nag or why don't you Too just get over it? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, how does empathic resonance differ from expressing sympathy or compassion with clients or patients? Yeah, this is an important question. Um, because, you know, in a state of sympathy, we're feeling uh, sorrow, pity, almost, feeling just badly for the person. We can see they're in pain. We don't necessarily understand how all the dots connect, but we can see that they're in pain. They're just sobbing, and, and we feel sorrow. We can feel compassion when we feel compelled to alleviate that pain and suffering. And very often, all three of these are happening together for a very good therapist, right? Mm -hmm. There's a sense of sympathy, there's a feeling of wanting to help, that compassion, and there's a curiosity to want to understand and really make sense out of what they're experiencing, whether they're highly detached or they're highly engaged in their vulnerable state. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what differentiates the three. Mm -hmm. And what difference does that make to the client when the therapist is able to express that resonance? Well, you know, some of the data suggests that although there are modest findings, they are consistent findings that the outcome, to achieve an effective outcome, meaning a healing outcome where adaptive change is possible, those components need to be in place, particularly the component of empathy, which means that I can understand, even if I don't agree, even if I don't endorse the behavior, even if I don't like the thinking because it smacks against maybe some of my biases, but I can get it. Mm -hmm. And getting it is really a key factor to being able to begin to either unravel it or deconstruct it or, or change it even, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, that meaning the problem. Right, right. And Wendy, beyond the general therapeutic standard of care, what is the role of empathy in schema therapy for narcissism, your area of specialty, and for the couples you treat who have issues of narcissism and other complex challenges? 
Yeah, thanks for asking that because it's really what led me to appreciate the power of empathic attunement and, and empathic resident, resonance. You know, the, the, the greatest obstacle for therapists in being able to be in a posture of empathy is getting triggered. So clearly, you know, narcissists and high conflict kinds of couples with narcissism in their relationships or anger in their relationships, bullying, these types of issues, um, they trigger us in the treatment. They trigger most people, but they trigger us as therapists because we're human too. Of course, And yeah. some of these, yeah. So when we're triggered, we're distracted. We're busy protecting ourselves because our own vulnerability has been activated. And it's difficult to be in a receptive place of empathy when we're triggered. And I learned these lessons well, making plenty of mistakes myself and recognizing my own, you know, schema activation under the condition of working with narcissists. It helped me to, to realize the value of having to work on me, having to decenter myself from that experience so I wouldn't be so vulnerable that I'd be distracted. Um, and then, of course, landing in my own maladaptive modes, but not so robotic that I was not real anymore mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. human. So we can't mute ourselves completely, but we don't want to become overwhelmed by those distractions because that's what will hinder empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I guess, just like any relationship, like in working with a couple, when there's a lot of fear present, if the couple is in distress, the attunement is really hard to achieve. Indeed. Uh, yeah, the anxiety Indeed. can just take over and you yes. lose the sense of where the other person is. Yeah, and it's so necessary with narcissism, just to answer your question more specifically, uh -huh. we have a strategy, as you know, in schema therapy called empathic confrontation. And while it's very helpful with many of our patients, it's especially important with those with narcissism because it allows us to hold them accountable and to capture their attention by first remembering what drives them, you know, what the motivational drivers are. So I can be very empathically attuned to why they might speak in a callous way, why they might become demeaning or critical or dismissive or disconnected or mm -hmm. angry or aggressive. I get it because I get the story so I can keep that little boy and his experiences or that little girl, you know, within me. And right. then it makes sense, and I'm not personalizing it. So I can put that out there as a way of understanding, but right. then hold them accountable in my confrontation about exactly. how it doesn't work in the here and now. Right, right. So when a client, let's say a narcissist, is going into one of their attack modes, mm. because you know what is happening in front of you as a schema therapist, the fear is going to be less likely erupted in you. So you can yes. actually, like you're describing, it sounds like stay present with yes. that client. Yeah, and, and there's enough of a little tweak in me, you know, I can feel mm -hmm. the pinch that helps me to appreciate what it's like for others in the world outside because I'm human. So yeah. I have to keep my realness available to me, mm -hmm. but not let it get the best of me where I've lost my center. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where we can keep, you know, we can, as I like to call it, sort of harness our empathic stance mm -hmm. when we're not being, you know, overactivated or triggered. Um, in those under those conditions right right and Wendy does the data suggest any links between empathic attunement in the therapy relationship and enduring change emerging in the treatment itself yeah that's something I was talking about a little bit earlier there's um, there is some data and it's fairly recent 2011 12 um, 10 maybe even more recent than that. I haven't finished doing all my investigations, but there is some research. Bohart Greenberg, of course, Leslie Greenberg is very notorious for his work on empathy, and I really appreciate his work on empathy. And, and then the work of, um, who are the others? Uh, Zuroff and, well, there are some, some interesting studies that look at meta-analyses and other um, investigations into the relationship between empathy and treatment outcome. Mm -hmm. Not just empathy in the form of understanding, but empathy in the form of resonance and real attunement with emotion. So evoking emotion, connecting with emotion, making sense out of emotions seems to correlate with um, a healing quality for the patient, meaning uh, the capacity to be, to be able to change their self-concept self mm -hmm. when it's at risk, when it's in danger. Mm -hmm. 
because maybe again that that trust can be there when you as you were describing earlier there's that felt sense that the therapist really gets what you're going through there's yeah. that safety because there's not that judgment there and there's that sense of safety that comes from feeling known right mm -hmm. so there's a difference I always tell I shared this with my patients I'll say there's a difference between saying you know I'm sorry I hurt your feelings and saying, you know, I'm sorry, I know that must have been very hard for you when I spoke to you in that tone. It must have reminded you of recent times when you were so hurt in that other relationship or of your father when he would get angry. Right. And I didn't really want to do that to you. You know, with narcissists, I'll say to them, this is about, you know, compassion for the wounded, not redemption of the sinner. You mm -hmm. know, too often we get caught up, especially when we're exercising remorse, we lose our empathic stance mm -hmm. because we don't want to be the bad guy. We just want to get off the hook. Right. That's a feature in narcissism. So, you know, we can, we can see somewhat clearly why it makes sense that empathy would have a certain sensibility in the healing part of treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what have you noticed are the obstacles to therapists harnessing a sturdy and effective empathically attuned mode as your keynote title states? Getting triggered, you know, getting triggered by um, patients like narcissists, like those with anger or abuse or aggression, those that are sometimes just highly avoidant and defiantly avoidant types can trigger us in the treatment room, activating our own schemas and then our own modes. And when I said, as I said earlier, when we're triggered, it's very difficult to be in that position of being a caregiver right. or being in that position of being steady and empathic and present because we're busy trying to protect ourselves or defend ourselves or advocate for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've lost our capacity to decenter, and so things become quite personal and painful. Right. And painful, right. And I would, I would imagine for, well, for myself and, and for all therapists, a big challenge might be just understanding when we're getting triggered ourselves, like what might be behind that, because of course yes. we all have blind spots. And yeah being able to track, you know, what is it about that client or patient that uh, maybe brought that up in me instead mm. of just blaming the client or patient as like, oh, they're going into that unhealthy mode, it's all them, it has nothing to do with me, right. of course. Right. What do you expect? It's a borderline patient. You can't help them. What do you expect? It's a exactly. narcissist. They're untreatable, exactly. you know, which is such an easy way for us to, you know, not look at our own self-work. And, yeah. you know, schema therapy is such a, a wonderful proponent of self-therapy, you know, looking right. at ourselves, trying to appreciate what's getting in the way and, and really resolving some of those issues. And I'm going to talk about that in the keynote, some of the ways in which, you know, we can keep ourselves, you know, regulated, if you will, and, mm -hmm. and maintain that empathic stance when faced with conditions that would otherwise trigger us. Yeah. And normalizing the process, and that's what I'm hearing yes. you say as well. It's like, it's, it's a normal thing. There are going to be certain clients, certain patients that are going to push our buttons in certain ways and expect it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's when, right. And, 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 put, and put it on the front stage because right. we, we often find that what would be so intuitive in other relationships feels not permissive in the therapy relationship. And yet, schema therapy also proposes a kind of realness, which I love. And so if you're triggered, there's nothing wrong with saying, gosh, I'm feeling triggered right now. Right. And your patient's kind of looking at you like, what? <laughs> yeah. And I'll say, well, you know, let me, just, let me just take a moment and see if I can find my way back. And right. we take that moment to do the work, which I'll elaborate on more in the keynote. But once you're back, then you don't have to tell your life story. That wouldn't really be appropriate. But mm -hmm. you can say, I was about to change the subject because it felt uncomfortable and then I realized that this is probably what happens in your life outside mm -hmm. and so I wanted to get myself steadied again so that I could come back and we could address this right so right. examples like that where being real has so much value for what's really happening in their world outside and the treatment room absolutely and building the trust going back yes. to that right yes that you're a real human being, you're not just on this pedestal as a therapist. Yeah, yeah. And Wendy, how do we bypass some of these obstacles that come up? Yeah, that's the part I'll elaborate on a little bit more, but briefly, we have to know our own makeup. You know, we have to know our own, so whether through our own therapy or good, 
position that uses a little, you know, self-work in the supervision, we need to know our schemas. We need to conceptualize our own self as a case. Uh, we need to anticipate what those glitches might look like, where we might find ourselves getting snagged um, by certain types of patients or certain types of conditions. And then, you know, in the same way we would expect of our patients to be able to take good care of our own vulnerable parts with an empathic and compassionate side of ourselves. So looking for support from others or from our own healthy adult. Um, you know me, I'm a big proponent of photographs. I like photos, so mm-hmm. I'm always trying to encourage patients and therapists and my supervisees, even get a photo of yourself as a little one and see if you can find that kind of endearing connection to that little part of you that allows you to remember that, you know, this is just all part of memory that gets stirred up and confused and we end up in time warp states that can be, you know, can be addressed when we put our feet back on the ground and when we take a moment to comfort that part of ourselves and get it out of the treatment room. Like I always say, if I'm feeling like I'm five in that moment, I can't take care of my patients. Right. You know, the five-year-old shouldn't be in the treatment room acting like a therapist or a caretaker. So I have to get the five-year-old comforted, and then I can return to that position of being a caregiver. Yeah, yeah, which goes back to what you were saying, I would imagine, about the therapist's self-work, how crucial that is. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, Wendy, is there anything that we haven't covered for today that you also wanted to mention just to give us a kind of a sneak peek of what's coming up in Vienna? Um, I'm really excited to be able to speak about this. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, I, again, I, I think it, it probably underscores in so many ways one of the more essential features in our effective work as clinicians Jeff would always say, you know, when the conceptualization isn't quite, you know, right, it, you know, we can end up down a path that isn't going to be helpful. If I'm not fully attuned to my patient and I'm just guessing based on a little bit of this and a little bit of that from what they've shared with me, but I'm not diving in deeper, I'm not working to feel and sense and make sense out of what they've experienced along their life cycle then I could find myself trying to heal, you know, de- issues of defectiveness when they feel pretty fine, in fact. It's not a defectiveness issue. It's, it's a more of a performance issue mm-hmm. where they're feeling like a failure or they're feeling incompetent. But they mm-hmm. feel lovable. Right. And so we don't, A, want to, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And what I love about empathy is it allows us to kind of custom fit the treatment in the way that, uh, you know, allows our patients to feel known for their own special story. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think empathy allows us to teach our patients how to honor their story, even when it's very sad and very tragic, uh, and find the courage to, to rise above it, because someone else gets it and knows it and, and can help them carry the pain. Yeah, exactly. Carrying the pain. Yeah. I'm not alone in this. Yeah. It's so crucial for all of us to be there. Again, Wendy Bahari, the title of her keynote at Inspire 2016 in Vienna, Empathically Attuned Caregiver Mode in the Treatment Room. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate Thanks, Travis. Appreciate highlights and look forward to seeing you in Vienna along with me everyone too. else. Me too. Thanks for having me. 